This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the Village's Chapel service. Pastor Bill is away, so I have the opportunity of being with you. It's highly unlikely that I'm a stranger to most of you. I've been on the staff for about 16 years. In fact, I'm so familiar with you that I think if I could visualize, I'd see a few of my friends out there with their coffee. Uh, two weeks ago, we celebrated Easter Sunday. That's the celebrating of the risen Christ. And two weeks from today, we're going to be celebrating Ascension Sunday, celebrating the time when Jesus left this earth and went to heaven. Today, I'd like to direct our attention to that place where Jesus ascended and where he invites us. Your outline, if you have one, has the music which kind of introduces us and then we'll be on talking about heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts for the tremendous blessing of being able to reach you in prayer anytime. We're also grateful for your amazing love which you expressed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Along with our prayers, and our praise and thanksgiving, we include some concerns. 
There can be much pain in our senior journey, some of the pain we share with others, some we share in silence. But bring relief, we pray, to the pain that is being observed in the lives of many today. And as you know, the sins which we have committed by our action and by their sins and the sins which we are guilty of, forgive us for our failures. We claim the promise that if we confess our sins, you will forgive us, and we believe that. Now, Lord, open our eyes to the needs around us as your children help us to be the salt and light in our needy world. May the Holy Spirit day by day help us to see you more clearly and love you more dearly. Surely, Lord, within the hearing of my voice, there are those whose hearts are heavy and some whose bodies hurt. Lay upon our hearts the identity of some of those whom we could help toward healing through a call or a visit along with a prayer. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who is our Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Well, I'm not noted for lengthy sermons, but uh, I've got one to keep you awake, I believe, and hopefully to challenge you. One Sunday morning, a minister approached the pulpit rather rapidly, and the congregation thought there must be something important that we're going to hear. And he called at the congregation, he said, all of you who want to go to heaven, stand up. And of course, the entire congregation stood up, except the little youngster in the first row, about eight years old. And the pastor went to above him and said, Sonny, don't you want to go to heaven someday? And he said, oh, yes, preacher, someday. 
but I thought you were putting up a load in the bus right now. Well, my sermon is about heaven, as I've said previously. The Apostle Paul longed for heaven. His mind was focused on heaven. Heaven was for him, as my title reads, a coveted prize. He was not physically a healthy man, nor was he very attractive. Some called him camel knees, and uh, writers have suggested that this if referred to the many amount of time that he spent on his knees. If you'd seen him along the Jordan River in a swimsuit, you would also notice that he's been beaten up. He had. The Jews arrested him and gave him 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten by rods. Once he was stoned and left for dead. Three times he was shipwrecked and once he was left in the ocean water for 24 hours. In addition to this torture, Paul had an extremely painful condition which he referred to as a thorn in the flesh. The actual nature of this problem has been a major study. The best explanation I have heard is that the pain was an intense, constant migraine. And Paul prayed about this problem, but then he stopped when God said, I'll give you grace so you can cope. But in addition to this, after he became a follower of Christ, he developed an incurable sickness. Surprisingly, he tells us he was thankful for it. How you can be thankful for any sickness is beyond our thinking. But he was thankful. Well, what kind of a sickness was it? It was diagnosed as homesickness. And not just homesickness, the ordinary garden variety, but homesickness for heaven. Paul had an addiction for heaven. I called Lucinda in the office this Tuesday, seeing if she had finished the bulletin. I hoped she hadn't. She said, yes, I have. I said, okay, I, I wanted to use a word to describe Paul, and I want to be sure I had the definition. The word was, he was addicted. I checked it out. Addiction has some very favorable words to adjoin it. Paul had an addiction for heaven. This addiction was a homeness, a, a homesickness that he cherished because it was for heaven. It was an intense desire, and he shared it wherever he went. Notice it. He explains this in the letter to the church in Corinth. If you have outlines, which some of you do, and Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Now we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Meanwhile, now notice what he says. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. For while we are in this tent, we groan and we are burdened. We are confident and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul is saying, if I had my choice to stay here or get rid of this tent, which we call our body, I'd cast a vote to leave home and get with the Lord immediately. I can almost hear the Apostle Peter saying, Amen, to Paul's words. Peter coveted heaven also. He called it a priceless inheritance. So, the question, what is so overwhelmingly attractive about heaven? When I told someone I was going to preach a short, uh, preach a sermon about heaven, he said, that should be a short sermon. We only know three things about it. It's up, God is there, and we're going to be there. <laughs> Now that inventory of heaven is very incomplete. 
we actually have a lot of insider information. Although the Bible doesn't answer all of our questions about heaven, the word heaven is repeated more frequently in the New Testament than the name of Christ. Just before the contents of the Bible were completed, the Apostle John wrote a revelation which contains some of God's blueprints for heaven. As you know, those of you who have studied that book, that you know it's a challenging text. And uh, for those of you who have given up trying to understand this book of Revelation, let me just summarize the entire volume with two words. God wins. The book of Revelation contains the most complete information available about God's strategy for final victory. The Apostle Paul, I was very acquainted with it, but the John, the visioner, was banished from the island of Patmos and placed in a position where he, the Apostle John, saw visions. He heard angelic messages, and he was instructed to put these in writing. That's the book of Revelation. If you ask someone to tell you something about heaven, their answer often is, well, the only thing I know for sure is there are golden streets. <laughs> well, there are golden streets, that's true. But heaven is much more than expensive pavement. Let me just say that if this morning, if your hunger for heaven is not intense, I hope you'll begin a journey and become like Paul, someone who covets heaven. Now instead of telling you what is in heaven to spiritually motivate you, I want to stir your desire for heaven by telling you what it is not. Number one, there will be no crying in heaven. I met someone for lunch. I was sitting at a corner table. He walked over, not looking very happy, sat down and I said, Joe, how's it going? And without saying a word, he placed his face in his hands and burst out into tears. And he apologized and uh, I said, that's okay, Joe. I cry sometimes. I think that sometimes it's a healthy therapy. Then he described the reason for his emotional outburst. Recently I saw someone. They were weeping as they picked up the receiver on a phone call, my phone call. Their first and only words were in turmoil. I've got to call you later. I just can't call. My brother just died. I got the word. They were in tears and not understandable beyond that. They hung up. There are many reasons for crying these days. And some of you have been in my position of either listening to someone in tears or being the emotional person. Folks, the word is out. There will be no Kleenex in heaven. Look at our outline at the first phrase of Revelation 21.4. He, God, will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Now some students interpret this as uh, implying that when we enter heaven, there will be tears. And, and we could imagine why what some possible reasons for it might be. Maybe when we catch our first glimpse of, of heaven, it is so beyond what we have thought and read and seen pictures of that we become emotionally uncontrollable and we break out with some tears. Tears can also be expected when we unite with loved ones as I was working on this sermon, it occurred to me that I've never called anyone dad. 
Six months before I was born, Dad passed away. Mom never remarried. Seeing him for the first time seems like a very emotional experience. And some suggest that tears in heaven could be attributed to sorrow when we realize that some of our loved ones are not present. Personally, I question that there will be tears of sorrow. But if, if something will moisten our eyes as we enter, it will be momentary. The Apostle John says, God comes along and he wipes away those tears and never, never again will we cry. Something else will be absent in heaven. There will be no more death. Look at verse 4 in your text. He, God, will wipe away every tear from our eyes, which we just covered. There will be no more death. Now, every year in good old USA, about 3.3 million people die. And, of course, last year would uh, take issue with that. It was far more expansive. But if we divide 3.3 million by 365, we discover that 9,000 people die in a normal day in America. One of the great words about heaven, one that Jesus used frequently, is the word eternal. Here's what Jesus told a crowd in Jerusalem about the magnificent difference between death and eternal life. John 5, 24. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Four days after Lazarus had died, Jesus was speaking with Martha. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And the text literally says that Mary got so excited about the good news that she called her sister. And uh, I don't think she found a phone to call, but she was spreading the news of eternal life, of life after death. She was so excited about it. And we, as we know, Lazarus became an example of that. In Romans 6, the Apostle Paul says that this experience of eternal life, it's a gift. Romans 3.23 The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Someone wrote, We are living in the land of the dying, moving toward the land of the living eternally. Before I have a memorial service which I officiated, the pianist played a number of, we call them, funeral hymns. And now later at the cemetery, I thank you for including a favorite of mine. It occurred to me that there will be no funeral songs in our heavenly hymn book. Nobody's dying. Nobody is, as we have said, He's gone to a better place. There is never a better place they can go to. That's it. Furthermore, one, once we see heaven, we will never leave. Thirdly, there will be no pain in heaven. Look again at Revelation 21, verse 4. I'm repeating it because there's a, a cycle here. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. When Jesus walked this earth, painkillers were not available at drugstore counters. Jesus was a painkiller. People walked long distances to see this painkiller who might be able to care for their intense feeling of pain. 
with their children, with their family, by themselves. We want to see. They didn't call him that, but they knew he was the one who could observe and kill pain. I've observed pain. I've made over a thousand calls in hospitals. I visited hospitals all the way from Vietnam to Africa. I've been in refugee camps where each morning the bodies of babies who didn't survive the night or mothers who just became exhausted and passed away. They're buried just outside the camp. Our world is submerged in suffering. As one finger, as one observer concluded, we take, we can take a globe and put our finger anywhere, and figuratively speaking, it bleeds. There are many suffering patients who will testify that just meditating on heaven can be a therapy more effective than drugs. Just knowing that heaven awaits us is comforting and healing right here and now. One more blessed absence from heaven. There will be no sin in heaven. Look at the last verse of our text, verse 27. Just the first phrase. Nothing impure will ever enter in. No sin means never will we speak, think, or commit any sinful act. The absence of Satan and the complete sanctification of our lives will mean that never again we will have to ask for forgiveness. Heaven will be totally sanitized. No sin in heaven also means heaven will be occupied only by born-again believers whose sins have been forgiven and whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I was in Tokyo with a tour group and we visited a large shrine. After the leader told us about the worship procedure of his adherents, I asked, I, it was an uncomfortable question, but I said, how are these worshipers of yours getting to heaven as you said they were? The guide said, oh, there's, there's many ways to get to heaven. It's, it's like a mountain. We're all climbing up the same mountain to the top. We're just taking different roads. That's not what Jesus said. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. Thomas, he was doing this all the time, raised his hand and said, Jesus, we don't even know where you're going. How can we get there? And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. I read somewhere that uh, in the state of Indiana there's a grave marker which reads, Come, follow me. Someone attached two lines below that marker and they said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. I'd like to attach the directions Jesus made to Thomas to that other in quotation. Here's what Jesus said. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. I close with this. The word prize is found only twice in my concordance. One of them is a tremendous testimony of Paul's tremendous 
goal to which he is addicted. Let me read Paul's words. One thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining for what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, set our minds and hearts to become increasingly addictive to heaven. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. And now enjoy the final hymn of heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory While we walk the pilgrim pathway Clouds will overspread the sky But when traveling days are over Not a shadow, not a sigh When we all, when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toil of life repay. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we, all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty we'll behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory